Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here tonight at this uh, nighttime hearing. As you all know, I try to limit these late uh, evenings, but I can't imagine a topic more worthy of our attention than ins ensuring that veterans have the education benefits they've earned and deserve. I'm proud and excited that we're all here to discuss H.R. 3218, the Harry W. Colmary Veterans Educational Assistance Act of 2017, which the ranking member and I introduced last Thursday with the support of every single member of this committee. H.R. 3218 and how we got here and where we are today is a shining example of how well Congress can and should work together. This bill is a result of the tireless work of many of the VSOs here tonight and the bipartisan efforts of this committee. And I'm proud of what we will empower service members, veterans, survivors, and dependents to achieve the, important, the improvements and enhancements included in this bill. This is the first major improvement to the GI Bill since 2011 and it encompasses 17 bills introduced by our colleagues, many of whom who serve on this committee, but also members of this body who share this committee's commitment to the men and women who serve. This package includes over 28 provisions and brings forward countless enhancements that veterans groups have requested for years. This isn't a package that comes along every day. H.R. 3218 has been aptly named after Mr. Harry W. Colmary, who is credited with actually writing by hand the first draft of the World War II era GI Bill. It's appropriate that we honor him for his work on this first GI Bill decades ago. Tonight's package would do a number of things, but I wanna focus on a couple of key improvements. It would, it would eliminate the 15 year time limit to use GI Bill benefits for future el eligible beneficiaries. Let me repeat that, for the first time in the history of the GI Bill, future beneficiaries will be able to carry these benefits with them throughout their lives. The bill would provide significant increases in GI Bill funding for reservists and guardsmen, including those who are currently serving on orders that do not accrue GI Bill eligibility, as well as dependents, surviving spouses, and surviving dependents. Provide 100% GI Bill eligibility for post 9-11 Purple Heart recipients and increase opportunities for veterans to complete a STEM degree or other high technology programs, something I know Leader McCarthy has advocated for, and it's a privilege to have him join us here tonight. The provisions I just mentioned only scratch the surface of the benefits that our veterans and survivors will receive under this bill. I'm also proud to, to that my bill, H.R. 1956, the Caring for Families of Our Wounded and Fallen Heroes Act, is included in this package. This bill will provide an additional $200 per month in education benefits to surviving spouses and children, those of whom who do not qualify for the Fry Scholarship. These individuals understand all too well what it means to make the ultimate sacrifice, and it's our duty to, and honor to provide for them as best we can. Before I yield to ranking uh, the ranking member, I would uh, be remiss if I didn't give my sincere thanks to the veteran groups, especially Student Veterans of America, for helping us make this happen. We owe a debt of gratitude to all the veteran service organizations who pushed for this package and stuck it out with us every step of this long process while we work to make this the best bill it can be. I commend and thank you because we, without a doubt, would not be sitting here on the verge of this historic moment without your efforts. I'll now turn it over to Ranking Member uh, Waltz for his statement. Well, thank you, Chairman Rowe, and uh, this really is a great night. I, uh, I, I think sometimes uh, patting ourselves on the back for things, you shouldn't be thanked for what you're supposed to do, but I think it's important to understand that legislating is never supposed to be easy. Uh, and this committee, again, has, has proven that uh, we can come together if the goal is, uh, is a unified uh, desire to see the best care and the honoring of our commitment to our veterans, and that has happened. I also think the way we do business in here, and this is a testament to Chairman Rowe's leadership, uh, we need to conduct ourselves in a manner that's befitting of the sacrifice of those who serve in uniform to allow us to self-govern, um, and this committee comes together. We differ on issues, but we do it in the manner that uh, that is befitting of that. So I am grateful. Uh, I too would like to thank all the members of this committee who have put in hard work. Many of their ideas are incorporated into this bill. Uh, those veteran service organizations, as mentioned, Student Veterans of America. Uh, I kind of heard if, if someone said they're the new kids on the block. If that's true, they're pretty 
quick learners, and they're pretty good at getting things done, and uh, I am grateful for that. Uh, to the American Legion, the VFW, and IAVA, once again, uh, holding true to, uh, to the Vietnam veterans mantra that one generational veterans will never forget another, and I think uh, this is multi-generational in how this bill impacts people, so I am grateful. Uh, to our witnesses today, to the ranking member, thank you for your active engagement in veterans' issues. Thank you uh, to Mr. McCarthy for making this a priority. Uh, saying it and following through with actions. Uh, we are grateful for that. Colonel Cook, as always, welcome back here. Uh, you did much good setting on this committee and you continue to do so, so we're glad to have you here. The, the chairman mentioned some of the highlights. I'd just like to thank the, the Forever Bill, uh, also uh, the name that may stick a little bit to this too, is lifting that 15-year cap, understanding the reality of what modern warriors look like and what it involves to, uh, to serve this nation in uniform, whether active or in reserve. It's just smart policy. Honoring those Purple Heart recipients, uh, just again, smart, and I want to thank Mr. Peters for his uh, continuous, uh, since he's been in Congress, uh, making sure that they are honored for their commitment. Um, and I'd also like to say the the Guard and Reserve Caucus, Mr. Palazzo, my co-chair in that, and all of us who have Guard and Reserve soldiers, the issue of the 12304B uh, of the call-ups under Title 10 that basically created a second class of, uh, of warriors that were out there. Uh, I have to tell you, this happened on Thursday night. Saturday, I was at a welcome back ceremony for the second of the 135, the Red Bulls, who have been doing the Sinai mission and they had not yet heard this, and to tell them that they are going to be restored and have their benefits that they had earned um, was just something to behold to see. And, and the thing that I heard afterwards is, working on this together for us really means something. It means that the, you know, the sacrifice and what they did there uh, does show that it matters. So thank you all. Um, we've got a little bit of a lift yet. Um, we, we would hope our Senate colleagues will follow our lead, um, take this thing, move it through, and I know the President wants to sign this. And uh, I am grateful, and once again, to the leadership uh, for putting this on the calendar, which I think is almost unprecedented, and guaranteeing us to get this to the floor. Uh, on behalf of our nation's veterans, thank you, Mr. Uh, Leader. I yield back. Thank you, General, for yielding. Before I yield to the committee members with provisions included in the package, I want to recognize uh, Majority Leader McCarthy for five minutes to discuss his provision that is included in this bill. You're now recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, um, Mr. Ranking Member, and all committee staff, I, I want to thank you for the opportunity um, to present to you and say a few words in support of the GI Bill reforms that this committee will take up this week. First, Mr. Chairman, and to all committee members, um, I want to begin by recognizing the positive work that this committee has achieved. This committee has shown time and again on a bipartisan way on how to govern. It is an example for all members and all of our colleagues. You will continue to work on a bipartisan basis and lead Congress to deliver on the duty to provide veterans better health care and positive post-service opportunities. The dynamic here is a model for all of our colleagues, as I said, and I look forward to continuing to work together on behalf of the men and women who protect and serve this country. Now, chief among the promises we make to the men and women who serve is to give them support and resources to obtain an education after service. It's the reason why many will at times even sign up. Applying the lessons they learn in the service to the lessons taught in the classroom is an enrichment opportunity that our society benefits from greatly. Now, the post-9-11 GI Bill has long helped countless veterans in educational and career pursuits. But today, we're on the brink of a vast career and work transformations. The rise of artificial intelligence and robotics are upending how jobs are performed, and we have traditionally known them in the past. But as we saw with the advent of the ATM, this disruption has promised to be a job creator, not a destroyer. The challenge before us is securing the right response for Americans to get ahead and take advantage of the changes. Now, news reports have shown and highlighted the skills gap in today's workforce. If we just look at the AP headline on the May jobs report, it was concise. Jobs data could signal a shortage of qualified workers to hire. By 2024, the tech industry is expected to add almost 500,000 new jobs to the industry. However, many tech employers are looking for candidates who have a particular skill set that candidates often don't learn in traditional settings. Consequently, industry employers have turned to non-traditional programs like boot camps, nano degrees, 
and coding schools to find candidates with the necessary skill set. The traditional career path is no longer a straight shot. These non-traditional technology education models are just part of the solution to closing the skill gap. Just ask Alphabet, Microsoft, Amazon, Ford, GE, or any other of America's great companies, and they will tell you of the promise these non-traditional models hold. But currently, veterans are unable to apply their GI education benefits to these courses. My provision in this legislation creates a pilot program to provide veterans the opportunity and ability to take advantage of these education opportunities. Veterans are prime candidate for tech positions because of their military discipline, ability to work under pressure, and teamwork. Many veterans often learn skills during their service and training that could be applied to the tech industry. The Vet Tech Act enables veterans to enroll in non-traditional technology courses and programs that are geared to getting a job after completion. The provision also provides the VA the necessary flexibility to approve these education programs while also guarding against abuses. These reforms the committee will consider this week will have a positive impact felt by the veterans returning to civilian life. This impact will be lifelong. And with a renewed commitment to a career preparation, particularly in the technology industry, American industry and our veterans stand to lead in the 21st century. I happen to serve in California. I look time and again at the number of jobs that are being hired. I look at the number of tech education that are helping change with nano degrees, the skill set for the individuals to be able to be there. But when I go to them and I meet with veterans and I know their background, I know their education, I know the knowledge of what they served when they served in the military, not to be able to use a GI Bill to get a nano degree to be hired by some of the top companies in this country that are craving them, I think it's a travesty and I think it's something that has to change. That's why I thank you for your work and the work you will do this week and I look forward putting it on the floor and getting it done in the next week. And I yield back. Uh, thank you, Mr. McCarthy, and I appreciate your passion for this, and I appreciate your support to, for affording uh, this bill next week. And I know you have places to be, so you're now excused. Thank you for being here. Before, before we recognize our other colleagues at the witness table, I'll recognize committee members who have provisions included in H.R. 3218. Mr. Takano, let's start with you. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to join my colleagues in expressing support for this bipartisan effort to secure the GI Bill for future generations of veterans. The GI Bill ser uh, serves two critical functions. First, it is a powerful tool for recruiting talented young people into military service. As we approach our 16th year at war, replenishing our all-volunteer military with patriotic and qualified Americans is vital to our mission abroad and our safety here at home. Second. The GI Bill ensures that veterans return home to more than just a thank you and a pat on the back. It ensures they are given the opportunity to build a rewarding, purposeful, and prosperous civilian life. This legislation guarantees that the GI Bill will continue to perform both of these functions for decades to come. And importantly, it does so without cutting benefits from anyone who is currently serving. I want to echo many of the supportive comments we've heard this evening and over the last week from members of Congress, as well as the veteran service organizations that play an important role in representing the veterans community. The removal of time restrictions for future GI Bill recipients, the deserved increases in funding for reservists and guardsmen, and the additional education support for veterans' families are all features of this legislation that are worth celebrating. This bill also incorporates my proposal to permanently authorize VA's work-study allowance program and my proposal to end the unequal treatment of reservists and guardsmen. This legislation gives them the same ability as active duty service members to accrue GI Bill benefits when they are ordered into active duty to receive medical care. But I want to focus on my comments, but I want to focus my comments on one piece of this legislative package that represents a major step forward for student veterans. For far too long, a swarm of predatory for-profit schools have exploited the generosity of the GI Bill 
and have cheated thousands of veterans out of the education and the future they deserve. In a 2014 Senate Help Committee study found that eight of the top 10 schools receiving post 9-11 GI Bill money were for-profit institutions. At the time, seven of those eight schools were under investigation for unethical business practices, including the now defunct ITT Technical Institute and Corinthian Colleges. From 2009 to 2015, these two schools collected more than a billion dollars in veterans benefits. I'm pleased that this bill provides relief to, to the thousands of student veterans who are left with non-transferable credits and a depleted GI Bill benefit when their school abruptly closes in the middle of a semester. Restoring both tuition and housing benefits to these veterans for a semester cut short by a school closure is simply the right thing to do. And by making this provision retroactive, we are restoring a measure of justice for the students at ITT Tech and Corinthian, as well as others across the country who have been left out in the cold by a college that shuts down without warning. I have advocated for this provision since my first days in Congress, and I truly appreciate Chairman Rowe and Ranking Member Wall's uh, work to include it in this bill. However, this bill does not solve the problem of, of unethical schools preying upon uh, veterans' benefits. In fact, its inclusion is evidence that much more needs to be done so that veterans are never forced to seek this type of relief in the first place. The 9010 loophole, which allows for-profit schools to count GI Bill benefits as private funding instead of federal funding, continues to incentivize aggressive recruitment of student veterans. That loophole still needs to be addressed. The gainful employment and borrows defense rules, which the Trump administration has put on hold, would finally establish oversight and, and accountability for unethical schools. Those rules still need to be implemented. As long as these issues remain unresolved, bad actors in the for-profit education industry will continue to defraud student veterans and taxpayers out of billions of dollars. I look forward to working with my colleagues to build on the progress we've made on this issue. Now, there's no question that we still have significant work ahead of us, uh, significant work ahead of us to address the challenges facing vet the veterans community, but this legislation is a milestone worth celebrating and certainly worth passing into law. The collaborative nature of this bill reflects the spirit of bipartisanship that has made this committee so effective over the past several months. Once again, I applaud the chairman and the ranking member for their leadership, as well as my colleagues on the committee who contributed to the strength of this legislation. I encourage all members to support this bill, and I yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman's comments, and I, I thank the gentleman for yielding. Mr. Bill Rockers, you recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I want to thank the ranking member as well. Uh, I'd like to thank my colleagues from both sides of the aisle for all their hard work in drafting this important bipartisan piece of legislation. And I really appreciate, Mr. Chairman, you giving us the opportunity uh, to testify on behalf of our provisions tonight. I really appreciate it. It's very good uh, that the, and it's good for the public uh, and, and our veterans to know what's in the bill. Uh, I'm proud of the work we have done this year to ensure that we as a nation take care of our veterans when they return home. But there's always more work to be done for these honorable Americans. The brave men and women of our U.S. Armed Forces have answered the call to protect the liberties we enjoy on a daily basis. We must answer the call to help our veterans in return. The challenges our nation's heroes face do not end on the battlefield, but continue as they make their transition to civilian life. We must find viable ways to improve both the effectiveness and delivery of transition resources. In order to give the best opportunities to our veterans, we must be prepared to address new needs as they are identified. And we're doing that in this committee. I'm very pleased my legislation, H.R. 1994, the, veterans, the Veteran Act, was included in the overall bill we are discussing today. My provision will make necessary investments to the information technology systems of the Veterans Benefit Benefits Administration. First, it requires all original and supplemental claims for educational assistance to be done electronically. Makes sense. This will ensure that veterans are able to receive their benefits in a more timely and efficient manner. 
the provision would authorize $30 million to help the VA carry out the mission of assisting our veterans in getting an education and transitioning back to civilian life. The Secretary of Veterans Affairs will be required to submit to Congress a plan to implement proposed changes and improvements within 180 days of its enactment. The plan will ensure that this committee has the necessary information to perform its oversight duties. After a year of implementing the changes, the VA Secretary will also be required to submit a report giving the committee an update on what is working and what is not working so that we can fix it. This will provide the committee with the information necessary to continue to improve, of course, how we serve our nation's heroes. Overall, this section will modernize the GI Bill claims process, processing and help streamline the system for veterans to receive their educational benefits. Mr. Chairman, I have a letter of support for my bill from uh, the, the Veteran Act that's included, uh, again, from uh, the Association of the United States Navy, which I would like to, uh, to ask unanimous consent to include for the record. Well, objections are ordered. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In closing, I remain dedicated to ensuring that our nation's veterans have access to the important educational benefits they have earned and deserve. We have a responsibility to make sure our veterans are fully prepared with the skills, resources, and education they need to thrive in civilian life. I urge my colleagues to support this beneficial piece of legislation, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank, thank you, Mr. My Vice Chairman, for yielding. Uh, Mr. Peters, thank you. You're now recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I do appreciate the, the chance to take a quick second to speak about uh, my bill that's included in this package. Uh, the bill would extend full education benefits to, serious, to honorably discharged Purple Heart recipients, regardless of their length of service. As you all know, uh, GI benefits are based on a rating system, and you need 36 months of active duty uh, to qualify for 100% benefits. One out of every five Purple Heart vets from, world, from the War on Terror who is using GI benefits does not qualify for the full rating, and others are discouraged from pursuing an education at all because their benefit doesn't cover the full cost of enrolling. This includes veterans like Marine Corps Sergeant Adrian Aranda, whose squad was hit by a landmine outside of Kandahar Airport in Afghanistan just three months after the 9-11 attacks. He sustained burns, shrapnel damage to the left side of his body, a broken hand, hearing damage, and a traumatic brain injury. Sergeant Aranda and his squad mates were the first service members to receive Purple Hearts in the War on Terrorism. After his service, Sergeant Aranda went on to earn an associate's degree from a community college and then graduated with a bachelor's from Texas Tech. And while pursuing his education, he discovered that he only qualified for a 50% rating for his educational benefits despite being severely wounded in the line of duty. We made a promise to the veterans who rushed to serve their country after 9-11 that we would honor their sacrifice and stand by them when they returned. It's wrong that we would exclude veterans like Sergeant Aranda, who suffered life-changing injuries fighting for this country from receiving full education benefits. By including uh, my Purple Heart Bill, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna help an estimated 660 Purple Heart recipients per year pursue a college degree or vocational training so they can land a good job and make the peaceful, prosperous transition to civilian life they deserve. In our time of greatest need, these brave service members fought and bled for us. They don't just deserve these benefits, just like their Purple Heart medals, they've earned them. Thank you to Chairman Rowe, Ranking Member Waltz. I've said this is a, mar uh, I agree with uh, Mr. McCarthy on this. This is a, um, exemplar of bipartisanship for the rest of the Congress. It's a pleasure to work on this committee. I want to thank the entire committee and committee staff and the VSOs, especially in this case, the Military Order of the Purple Heart, for working with us to include this as part of the Forever GI Bill. And I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Peters, for yielding in those kind of remarks. Mr. Kaufman, you're now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, thank you for holding uh, this hearing tonight and for including uh, my legislation in the, uh, in the uh, Veterans Education Assistance Act. Uh, having earned an uh, under undergraduate uh, degree at the University of Colorado under the Vietnam era GI Bill, uh, I fully understand the importance of this benefit uh, to our veterans and, and to our 
to our nation. Uh, my legislation, H.R. Uh, 2549, the, the GI Bill Process Improvement Act, which I introduced with uh, Congressman O'Rourke, would ensure those receiving GI benefits uh, for their military service do so in a more timely manner. Uh, it also improves oversight of schools and educational facilities who receive uh, VA funding for requiring them to certify that GI Bill funds received are in fact used for veteran services. Lastly, my legislation would require that uh, schools, uh, school certifying officials, SCOs, are properly equipped to better counsel veterans on academic courses and their uh, financial benefits by requiring more transparency and efficiency from our academic institutions serving our nation's veterans, we ensure our veterans are, uh, use their GI Bill benefits to realize uh, their full potential. Mr. Chairman, I am also proud uh, to be an original co-sponsor uh, of this larger GI uh, Bill reform effort. The Veterans Education Assistance Act includes many life-changing provisions, such as a lifetime benefit of the GI Bill and an additional nine months for GI Bill eligibility when pursuing a STEM degree, uh, protection of GI Bill benefits for veterans uh, impacted by a school closure, and make it easier for veterans to use their GI Bill for uh, tests that lead to a uh, license or a credential. Mr. Chairman, it is important that this committee make a veteran's uh, transition as seamless and rewarding as possible. And the Veterans Educational Assistance Act just does exactly that. I look forward to continue working with you uh, to make sure we can deliver uh, you and the ranking member, sorry, Major Walsh, a, a, a GI Bill that is worthy of our service, of the service and sacrifice those fighting for our nation have shown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the remainder of my time. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Uh, Dr. Winstrup, you're now recognized for five minutes. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am I'm pleased to be an original co-sponsor of H.R. 3218, the Harry W. Colmery Veterans Education Assistance Act of 2017. And I'm thrilled that the legislation I introduced to expand benefits to our military's reserve and guard components is included as a provision. This, pro this provision, which I introduced as a Guard and Reservist Education Improvement Act, would enhance the amount of GI Bill eligibility for service members who don't serve enough time to receive 100% of the benefit. So currently, service members who serve at least between three to six months and six months to less than 12 months of active duty service can qualify for 40 and 50% of the full GI Bill benefits, respectively. What this provision would do would increase these benefits to 50% and 60%, respectively, which for students attending a private school would result in approximately $2,300 more a year in tuition than they are receiving now, and would receive even more money for their housing allowance. The brave citizen soldiers in the reserve component and the Guard, of which more than a million have been mobilized since 9-11, contribute greatly to the end strength of our armed forces. And they often have to juggle careers, families, and, and the service to our great nation. We must do all that we can to support those who put their lives on the line for our great nation. And easier access to an earned education benefit is critical. The underlying bill goes far to accomplish this goal. Increasing accessibility to the educational opportunities that the GI Bill provides helps ensure the men and women who have worn this nation's uniform receive the benefits they have earned and are equipped with the education they need to be successful. And our veterans have a high success rate in education. So I'm proud to support these initiatives and um, these much needed improvements, many of which originated from veterans themselves and through the VSOs. And I thank my colleagues on this committee for their willingness and commitment to forge a path forward on a bipartisan basis to get things done. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, gentlemen, for yielding. Uh, Mr. Rutherford, you're recognized now for five minutes. Good evening, Chairman Rowe and Ranking Member Walls and uh, the rest of the committee. I want to thank you for this opportunity to testify uh, on behalf of the Julian Woods Yellow Ribbon Program Expansion Act, which has been included in Section 108 of H.R. 3218. In, in my time as a member uh, on this committee, I've been encouraged by our work to improve the lives of our service members and their families. Almost every day, 
we hear about new ways we can enhance the assistance our service members and their families receive. And I believe, as you do, that it's very important that we seriously take these recommendations under consideration. One component of these benefits focuses on the educational success of these selfless men and women. The Marine Gunnery Sergeant John David Fry Scholarship currently pays a benefit equal to the post-911 GI Bill to the children and surviving spouses of service members who die in the line of duty. Eligible recipients are entitled to 36 months of benefits at the 100% level and receive a monthly living stipend and book allowance. Roughly 6,000 surviving dependents and spouses of those who died serving their country rely on this scholarship to cover their educational expenses. And as anyone who has sent a child or loved one to school recently knows, college is incredibly expensive. The current benefit payment of the post-911 GI Bill is roughly $23,000 a year, uh, which covers most of the institutions, though not the intent of the law. This cap places financial restrictions on pr prospective students that have suffered hardship of losing a loved one. For service members on the post-9-11 GI Bill, this is where the Yellow Ribbon Program comes in to help. Under the Yellow Ribbon Program, degree-granting institutions of higher learning may choose to make additional funds available if the cost of attendance is above the cap that is uh, set by the post-9-1-1 GI Bill. Uh, these institutions voluntarily enter, enter into an agreement with the VA at no additional cost to the service member's GI Bill privilege and the VA matches that amount to help cover the additional cost. Hundreds of institutions participate in this program. Under current law, however, those on the Fry Scholarship are not eligible for the Yellow Ribbon Program. This means that the surviving spouses and children of those who have died in the line of duty are limited in their ability to choose the institution of higher learning that, they, that would best help them succeed. Section 108 is simple yet impactful. It would extend the Yellow Ribbon Program to those on the Fry Scholarship. I believe that when we empower the members of our service, men and women, both fallen and surviving, we strengthen our communities, we embolden our institutions, and we reinvigorate our future. Upon introdu introduction of this bill, I was reminded of Petty Officer 3rd Class Julian Woods, a Jacksonville native killed in action in Fallujah during Operation Iraqi Freedom in 2004. Petty Officer Woods was a hospital corpsman killed by enemy fire as he rushed to aid a fallen soldier. When I introduced H.R. 2103, I spoke with Julian's mother, Carolyn, who told me that any work that we do to ease the mind of any person who either served or lost someone that they loved in the line of duty is of incredible importance. I agree with her and I want to do everything that we can to ease the burden of those who have lost a loved one, including Petty Officer's only daughter. His loss was a tragedy for his family, his daughter, our community, and our nation. I thank the chairman, the ranking member, and the VSOs and the committee staff for working together on this vital piece of bipartisan legislation. And I look forward to working with you all to move it forward. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Rutherford, for that compelling uh, testimony. Uh, Mr. Banks, you're now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We all obviously agree on the importance of economic opportunity and skills acquisition for our veterans. Helping our veterans not just afford an education, but also to maneuver the transition from service member to student is one of the best ways that we can help our veterans. Since 2009, the VA has operated a pilot program called Vet Success on Campus, or VSOC, which helps veterans, service members, and their families succeed on campus by providing educational and vocational counseling services. These services are provided through a vocational rehabilitation counselor who works with student veterans to ensure they reach both their educational and career goals. This includes equipping them with the knowledge on how to effectively use the GI Bill. The pilot program began in 2009, and since then it has expanded to 94 campuses across the country. 
In March, I introduced legislation that would make this a permanent program authorized by statute. The text of the bill has since been included in the bill uh, we are discussing today, H.R. 3218, along with many other important reforms for our student veterans. For that, I'm very grateful on behalf of the thousands of veterans uh, on college campuses all over the country. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, and with over three and a half minutes left, I yield back. <laughs> I think everyone in the room thanks the gentleman for that. Uh, <laughs> Thank, thank all of my colleagues. And with us today at the witness table, we have our colleagues, um, Colonel Paul Cook of California, former member of the committee, and uh, Luke Messer of Indiana, policy chair on the Republican side. Thank you for being here tonight, introducing bills that we include in the package. Uh, Mr. Messer, you're now recognized for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I didn't know I'd be first. First, I want to thank you for your leadership and your commitment to veterans and your help with me today as we work through this legislation on this bill. I want to thank all the members of the committee for the important work that you do. And I do have to give a slight shout out to my colleague from the great Hoosier State and appreciate his leadership, Mr. Banks, and, and all you do for the committee. Um, I also want to just thank you for including my proposal in, your, in this legislation to help veterans impacted by the closure of ITT Tech in this bipartisan GI Bill reform package. When Indiana-based ITT Tech Technical Institute abruptly closed its doors, 40,000 students nationwide, including 7,000 veterans, were left high and dry. Thankfully, help came for some. If a student attended ITT Tech through a Pell Grant, they had that Pell Grant restored. And if they took out a federal loan, the loan was forgiven. But nothing has been done for the student veterans who use their GI Bill benefits to attend ITT Tech. Frankly, our veterans got a raw deal. Jason Nikos, a U.S. Navy veteran from Greenfield, Indiana, in my district, had to start his degree completely from scratch after spending two years at ITT Tech. Not a single credit transferred, and his GI Bill is going to run out before he can finish a new degree. He told my office, quote, to spend two years of my life at a place with nothing to show for it is one of the biggest disappointments I've ever experienced. And Jason's story is sadly one of thousands. It's not fair that these veterans would lose their GI benefits through no fault of their own. They deserve better. My proposal restores GI Bill benefits to veterans who were attending ITT Tech when it closed. So that, they can defend, so that they can finish their degree elsewhere. It also helps veterans who may be impacted by a school closure in the future. Our servicemen and women count on GI Bill benefits to help them start a career and build a life after serving our country. The least we can do is to make sure they get that chance. Thank you, Chairman, again, and thank your staff for working with us on this critical issue. And I yield back the two minutes and 30 seconds of my time. Thank you, gentlemen, for yielding. And some of us, as Mr. Walls pointed out, in Congress may spend two years and accomplish absolutely nothing either. <laughs> so we're, we're glad this is, this is something that was overlooked and should be taken care of and, and really, really pleased that these students are going to be able to get their, their time back and be able to go on with their lives. Uh, Colonel, you're now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First, I want to thank you and Ranking Member Waltz for including my bill, H.R. 245, the Veterans Education Equity Act, as part of the larger bill, the GI Bill Reforms. As a veteran and college professor serving veterans and ensuring an affordable path to higher education have always been high priorities. The GI Bill addresses these two critical issues and has been a huge success in helping millions of veterans get an education. Uh, by the way, I want to correct the, uh, the record in that uh, Mr. Poliquin has been spreading a rumor that I was a veteran of the Revolutionary War. <laughs> and I, I just wanted to make sure that was included. <laughs> One part of the GI Bill is the basic allowance for housing, a monthly stipend that assists veterans with living expenses while in school. Unfortunately, the current formula prevents some veterans from receiving a fair housing payment 
based on their true cost of living or housing. Currently, the basic allowance for housing payment is based on the zip code where the veteran's school is headquartered rather than the zip code where the veteran attends classes. This policy results in a monthly payment that sometimes fails to cover basic housing needs or far exceeds the cost of living in certain areas. It also places schools headquarters in lower income zip codes at a recruiting disadvantage because they offer student veterans a much lower monthly payment than satellite campuses of schools headquartered in more expensive areas. In the Morongo Basin, which is uh, the home to the Marine Corps Air Ground Combat Center, and I might add that uh, one of the members of your committee was uh, formerly served in that area, uh, where I live, many of the veterans utilizing the basic housing allowance are adversely affected by the current payout formula. Take, for example, one community college is located and headquartered in Joshua Tree, California, a low-cost area, and a second one is headquartered in Orange County, California, a very expensive area but offers classes at satellite facilities in the Morongo Basin. Because the current basic allowance for housing payment, payment is calculated based on the zip code where the college is headquartered, veterans in the Marine, or excuse me, the Morongo Basin taking classes from the Orange County based college receive as much as $1,000 more per month than students taking classes at the locally headquartered community college. There are, these are students living in the same community with the same housing costs, but one student receives significantly more money than the other student. This not only affects, uh, subs uh, not only af effectively subsidize some schools at the expense of others, but also wastes valuable taxpayer dollars that should be spent on educating our veterans. In other communities, the reverse is true. Satellite campuses that are headquartered in less expensive communities can leave student veterans without sufficient funds to cover their housing needs. The Veterans Education Equality Act fixes this discrepancy by calculating the basic allowance for housing payments based on where the student attends classes, not where the institution of higher headquarters is, uh, excuse me, where the institution of higher learning is headquartered. This bill ensures veterans receive an adequate and fair housing allowance while eliminating a source of abuse in the program. It will ensure that veterans receive payments that meet their true costs of housing. Chairman Rowe and Ranking Member Waltz, I wanna thank you both again for including my bill in the Harry Comery Veterans Educational Assistance Act of 2017. Um, I have 15 seconds, and I want to also add that to the time left on it, and I, had, I talk longer than most people. Thank you again for... You could have some of my time. Thank you, Colonel. You could have some of my time. No, I, I appreciate both of you all being here, and we'll forego a round of questions for our colleagues. Any questions anyone may have may be submitted for the record. Thanks both for you being here. You all are excused now. Thank you, sir. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, joining us on our second panel and final panel is Mr. Kurt Coy, Deputy Undersecretary for Economic Opportunity at the Department of Veterans Affairs, who is accomplished, uh, accompanied by Mr. James Ruhlman, Assistant Director for Policy and Procedures of the v uh, VA Education Service, Mr. Patrick Murray, Associate Director of the National Legislative Service for the Veterans of Foreign Wars, Mr. William Hubbard, Vice President of Government Relations for Student Veterans of America, Mr. John Kamen, Assistant Director of the Veterans Employment and Education Division for the American Legion, and Ms. Ashlyn Haycock, the Senior Coordinator for uh, Education Support Services at the Trage uh, Tragedy Assistance Program for Survivors. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Your complete written statements will be entered into to the hearing record. <clears throat>
We'll get one more chair, and then there we're not. Okay, Mr. Coy, you're recognized for five minutes. Good evening, Chairman Rowe, Ranking Member Waltz, and distinguished members of the committee, and particularly those members of the Economic Opportunity Subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today to discuss legislation pertaining to the Department of Veterans Affairs programs. Perhaps more importantly, thank you for your passionate interest in our student veterans. It is an honor to be here to represent VA and those individuals, <clears throat> excuse me, who work hard every day to deliver those benefits veterans have earned. And if I may, we would also like to again compliment the committee staff for their professionalism, hard work, and passion to assist veterans. Accompanying me today is James Ruhlman, Deputy Director of our Education Service. As we reviewed the Harry W. Comery Veterans Education Assistance Act of 2017, we are encouraged by the number of sections improve, aimed at improving educational opportunities for veterans and their beneficiaries. When I testified at the Senate Veterans Affairs Committee on many of the same proposed legislative actions, I said the post 9-11 GI Bill is truly transformative. In a recent talk I gave, I indicated that the original GI Bill, or Service Members, Servicemen's Readjustment Act of 1944, was the product of what happens when goodwill and the right thing come together in Congress. It created a civic renaissance by treating all veterans as first-class citizens. Empowering veterans proved and continues to prove to be the catalyst to revitalizing and driving America forward. The original GI Bill was heralded as a success and a major contributor to America's stock of human capital that sped long-term economic growth across the nation. Eight million World War II veterans used the GI Bill and Tom Brokaw called them the greatest generation. Many believe, including me, particularly as you look at the young men and women testifying at this evening, all GI Bill graduates, that we are on the precipice of the next greatest generation. And that's no slight to veterans in between, including myself. I am hopeful that this hearing will be somewhat uneventful as VA has outlined support, some with concerns and a caveat that they are subject to offsets for almost all of these sections. We are happy to work with the committee to ensure we achieve the best possible outcomes for veterans, service members, and their families. We also note that many of these bills would require changes to our IT systems and will require staff and resources in order to successfully implement them. We appreciate your consideration of many of the effective dates that give us time to implement them should they be signed into law. The department looks forward to working with the committee and rather than attempt to synopsize our views on each of the 29 sections, we would like to return some of my time in my oral statement in order to have the opportunity for the subcommittee to ask questions and comment on my testimony. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my statement. Again, thank you for your generous interest in improving the lives of veterans and their families and I would be pleased to respond to any questions you or the members of the committee may have. Uh, thank you, Mr. Coyle. And just a question I'm going to ask the audience and everybody in this room. How many of us have used a GI Bill? Just hold your hand up. Awesome. Thank you very much. Wow. Um, thank you, Ms. Murray. You're now recognized for five minutes. Chairman Rowe, Ranking Member Walls, and members of the committee, on behalf of the men and women of the Veterans of Foreign Wars of the United States and its auxiliary, thank you for the opportunity to provide our marks on today's pending legislation. <clears throat> the VFW strongly supports restoring educational benefits for those servicemen and women called to active duty. National Guardsmen and Reservists were placed on voluntary action order, activation orders that did not allow them to accrue benefits through time and service like their active duty counterparts. While stationed abroad and away from their homes and families, these troops are denied the ability to gain educational credit for use after demobilization. 12304B and additionally 12301H orders need to be amended to keep the activation authority but reinstitute the, benef reinstitute the benefits that were removed. Thousands of National Guardsmen and reservists 
have been affected by this change. More and more DOD is using our nation's reserve component to fight our decade and a half war against terror, and these men and women to come home without equal benefits is something that must be changed. The VFW supports giving full educational benefits for recipients of the Purple Heart. For the past decade and a half, we've been sending reservists into harm's way at an unprecedented level, and some of them have been wounded in the line of duty. Nearly 1,500 of these citizen soldiers have bled for this country, but have not accrued enough active duty time to attain full GI Bill benefits. This is the least we can do as a country to help those who put their bodies on the line for our freedom. I especially support this bill because I have a personal relationship to it. Jonathan Goldman served in Iraq in my squad, and he was my driver the night that our vehicle was hit by an ID. John, like the rest of our team, was pretty banged up, but he was the only one who ultimately did not have to end up being medically retired due to his wounds. John still carries the scars with him today, and he's not eligible for many of the other benefits that myself and my other teammate received. Extending mere months of education eligibility for troops like John is something the VFW fully supports and I personally support vehemently. Finally, I'd like to focus on the school closure section of this bill. The VFW strongly supports this portion of legislation to protect student veterans who are negatively affected by school closures. Recently, ITT Tech, Corinthian, and West Tech College suddenly shuttered their doors after losing accreditation. This left thousands of student veterans out of school mid-semester with no plan for what to do the rest of the term. They'd lost weeks or months of GI Bill benefits that were wasted at failed institutions. Even worse, they lost the monthly housing stipend many relied upon for their living situation. After the failure of ITT Tech, the VFW reached out to these student veterans affected by the closure and offered them assistance to our Unmet Needs Grant Program. The VFW provided students with emergency grants in order to keep them afloat for another month or so. The impact the school closing had on these student veterans was devastating. We received multiple responses to the students we, re we reached out to, and the reports of their situations was disheartening, to say the least. We had reports of veterans being mere weeks away from living in their cars, veterans choosing between which meals to skip during the day, and no help from the VA or their schools to rectify the situation. Thankfully, we were able to reach out and help these students during their struggle, but the VFW and organizations like ours cannot be the only entities stepping up to remedy this situation. We provided the student veterans with some financial stability to make it through the next few weeks while they got settled after this major life upheaval. This, however, was only a Band-Aid for the real problem. These student veterans need protection for issues, issues like this so they do not be affected as badly as they are in the future. This legislation allows for the affected student veterans to recoup the lost months of GI Bill eligibility in only the semester their schools are closed. While we support this initiative, we feel it does not go far enough. We think student veterans should be able to recoup their months of eligibility wasted at the closed institutions, just like traditional students can with Pell Grants. Student veterans who attended schools like ITT have now lost these months of eligibility and they have no credits to show for it. The VFW has heard from these student veterans from the closed school and they're now struggling to complete their degrees at other institutions without their previous earned credits. GI Bill eligibility should be allowed to be recouped and student veterans deserve the same equality as every other student affected by school closures. This bill is an important first step towards rectifying this entire situation. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my testimony. I'll be happy to answer any questions you or the committee may have. Thank you, Mr. Murray. Mr. Hubbard, you're now recognized for five minutes. Chairman Rowe, Ranking Member Walls, and members of this committee, thank you for inviting Student Veterans of America to submit our testimony on the Harry W. Colmary Veterans Educational Assistance Act. This legislation seeks to fix many of the current challenges within the post-9-11 GI Bill, while also addressing ongoing inequities, to provide veterans and their families access to the benefits they earned. In May, we convened nearly 40 military, veteran, and higher education organizations for a roundtable discussion at the headquarters of our friends at the American Legion to discuss education policy priorities for veterans. And last week, we had the second roundtable discussion hosted by our gracious friends at the VFW to determine how we make those priorities a reality. 
This proposal is where it's at today, thanks to the incredible leadership of this committee, as well as the support from the following organizations. The Veterans of Foreign Wars, Got Your Six, the Tragedy Assistance Program for Survivors, Vietnam Veterans of America, the American Legion, and the Military Order of the Purple Heart. This broad coalition of organizations and many others is firmly committed to getting the Comary GI Bill through this Congress and onto the President's desk for signature. The first inequity addressed in this proposal includes the National Guard and Reserve members who served under the 12304B authorization orders. I would like to highlight the case of the deployment of the Special Purpose Marine Air Ground Task Force in 2016, who experienced this issue firsthand. In the case of this unit, hundreds of Marine Corps Reserves were inaccurately advised by senior leadership that they would receive GI Bill benefits for their active duty service, only to later learn that they would get nothing. The fully retroactive solution in this proposal addresses this regrettable oversight. Next, this legislation would begin to tackle the challenge of making whole veterans who experience school closures. The closure of ITT Tech demonstrated that the issue of school closures is not likely to go away any time soon. Beginning with the stunning moral and fiscal bankruptcy of the Corinthian Colleges brought to light in 2015, student veterans are known to be the only students that currently receive no type of restitution. We also strongly encourage the consideration of the following recommendations. Broaden the restitution for veterans who experience school closures, ensuring that VA has similar authority to restore GI Bill benefits as the Department of Education to provide restitution for federal student loan borrowers after school closures. Full funding for the state approving agencies, the, GI, the watchdogs of the GI Bill, with a total annual increase from $19 million to the requested funding rate of $26 million, with assurances that these additional funds will help prevent future school closures by looking out for signs of predatory programs. Restoration of GI Bill benefits for any credits earned at a closed school that cannot be transferred to a new program or institution, with a specific focus on providing relief to the beneficiaries affected by the ITT closures. We also enthusiastically praise this committee for the recognition of the importance of and the value of science, technology, engineering, and math STEM degrees. These degrees pr provide a high value for the veteran and the country, but often require additional time to complete. We would like to work closely with the SAAs to ensure students entering these fields are protected and that they reflect the national need. I want to also acknowledge Congressman David McKinley and Congresswoman Dina Titus for recognizing this challenge early and remaining steadfast in pursuing the STEM Extension Act now included in this package as the Edith Rogers Scholarship. When I first saw the text of this bill, I thought, if student veterans sat down to write a bill, it would look like this. This package reflects so many essential solution-oriented provisions that increase access to education, address the inequities of this earned benefit, and look forward to the future well beyond our own generation. The passage of this bill will represent the start of a new era for education for veterans. Additionally, the staff of the chairman and the ranking member demonstrated their dedication to the cause of veterans in such a manner that it is humbling to consider them as colleagues and friends. I would like to acknowledge John Clark, Kelsey Barron, Ray Kelly, Kathy Yu, Caroline Ponsetti, and Tiffany Haverly. To each of you, you have demonstrated the heartfelt appreciation of millions of veterans and their families. To Leader McCarthy and Leader Pelosi, as well as their staff, Tiffany Wolfolk, and Patty Ross, you also have proven a spirit of bipartisan, bipartisanship and commitment to veterans that will be remembered for many years to come. Chairman Rowe, Ranking Member Walls, America is fortunate to have you at the helm of this esteemed body. Two members of Congress that have demonstrated a model of bipartisanship and collaboration to the country. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Harbour, for your kind words and your leadership on this issue. Mr. Kamen, you're recognized now for five minutes. Chairman Rowe, Ranking Member Walls, and distinguished members of this committee, on behalf of National Commander Charles E. Schmidt and the two million members of the American Legion, we thank you for your leadership on behalf of service members and veterans. The last few months were not easy as solutions were proposed to improve the GI Bill. With public disagreements dividing us, many believe that it would be impossible to get anything done this year for veterans' education. Yet this committee made it happen in under three months. 
This reflects remarkable determination and statesmanship from Chairman Rowe and Ranking Member Walls, as well as a broad bipartisanship that rose to the occasion. As the largest organization of wartime veterans, we appreciate the opportunity to present the American Legion's views on the Harry W. Comery Veterans Educational Assistance Act. As all of us have worked together over the past few months on the future of the GI Bill, we can think of no greater namesake than our past National Commander Harry Comery. In 1943, the Committee on World War Veterans was deeply focused on the inevitable issues service members would face whenever the war ended. Many believe that education had no place as a veteran's benefit, and others believe the benefit should be limited exclusively to wounded veterans. Yet Harry, Harry Comery had a different vision. As a World War I veteran, he knew firsthand the challenges of transitioning from war. He saw the potential for a benefit that didn't create dependence, but would foster greater citizenship through economic empowerment. A benefit rooted in the idea that the individual, not the government, could decide how and where to use it. A benefit that would challenge the status quo that education was the providence of the wealthy and the elite. Working from Washington's Mayflower Hotel, over five months, Comery hand wrote page after page of his vision on the back of hotel stationery. These notes would become the Service, the service Members Readjustment Act of 1944. As we now turn our attention to improving our generation's GI Bill, we proudly proclaim that this bill reaffirms the ideals of Harry Comrie and the American Legion, that investing in veterans' education makes this country greater. This bill does this through 28 distinct sections. Most strikingly is making the GI Bill a forever benefit. This has the potential to greatly increase GI Bill usage rates by providing service members the flexibility they need to pursue their educational aspirations. No matter how widely it is known, not all veterans will utilize the GI Bill with a 15-year cap, simply because it doesn't make sense for some of them to use it. If a Marine sergeant with a bachelor's degree transitions to civilian life as a government contractor, it may not make sense to immediately use the GI Bill. However, if 15 years later she seeks a different career path, the GI Bill is as valuable to her future as it was as if she had just transitioned from active duty. This bill makes it possible for veterans to utilize this benefit at the right time in the right place, and more importantly, it takes the benefit out of the government's hand and gives it to the veteran. This bill also begins to address a burgeoning issue, unequal education benefits for reserve and National Guard service members with the advent of 12304B orders. While there have been roughly 6,000 activations thus far, make no mistake as to how the Department of Defense intends to utilize this order. To wit, the Department of the Army's OCO budget requested 18,738 man years for 12304B orders for fiscal year 2018. We could have, not asked, could have not asked for a better champion on this than a National Guard Sergeant Major, and we applaud the ranking members for, for its tenacity on behalf of all Guard and Reservists. This bill not only accomplishes this, this, but also awards retroactive benefits to all service members issued these orders. As this committee affirms its commitment to veterans' education, it is for us to rededicate our efforts to refining the GI Bill for the next generation. We see numerous areas that can still be improved. Increasing the state approving agency's funding from 19 million to a rate of 26 million so that SAAs can effectively perform their oversight responsibilities. Empowering our service members and veterans to be informed consumers who can make the best choices they can on how to use their benefit. And developing a solution that would provide GI Bill resources and startup capital to small businesses just as the original GI Bill did. These improvements may seem small, but the impact cannot be overstated. Just as the original GI Bill was beyond any measurement at the time, the bills that this committee passes will have an impact beyond our years, not just on our veterans, but as the country as a whole. As I conclude, I would like to quote the closing remarks of Harry Comrie's testimony to Congress in 1944. These men will be a potent force for good or evil in the years to come. They can make our country or they can break it. They can restore our democracy or scrap it. They can promote world order or World War III. The answer lies in, le lies in leadership. We look to the American Congress to step forward and give some of that leadership. This is your opportunity, and you can count on the American Legion to add its experience and influence to assist in guiding and directing the nation along the path of peaceful progress. Chairman Rowe, Ranking Member Walls, distinguished members of this committee, to evoke Harry Comrie, you can still count on us today. Thank you very much, very much and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Kamen. Uh, Ms. Haycock, you're recognized now for five minutes. Chairman Rowe, oh. Chairman Rowe, Ranking Member Waltz, and distinguished committee members, thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of surviving families of our nation's fallen heroes. I am the surviving daughter of Army Sergeant First Class Jeffrey Haycock, who died in the line of duty in 2002, and Air Force veteran Nicole Haycock, who died by suicide in 2011. 
In 2010, I was one of the very first recipients of the Marine Gunnery Sergeant John Fry Scholarship. And for that opportunity, I'm incredibly grateful to this committee. TAPS would like to thank the committee for several expansions of survivor benefits included in the Jeff Miller and Richard Blumenthal Veterans Healthcare and Benefits Improvement Act of 2016, such as guaranteed in-state tuition for Fry recipients and additional time to utilize the Fry Scholarship for our earliest post-9-11 widows. TAPS' main legislative priority over the last several years has been the expansion of the Yellow Ribbon Program to Fry Scholarship recipients. Currently, only those receiving the post-9-11 GI Bill and those with transferred entitlement are eligible. If the veteran is still alive and transferred their benefits to their dependents, they would be eligible for this expanded benefit, while children and spouses of America's heroes who died in the line of duty are not. We would like to see this inequity corrected. This impacts children like Emily McClemens, whose father was an Army officer, killed in action in 2011 when Emily was just 13 years old. Emily is a sophomore at Texas Christian University. The tuition is over $40,000 per year, but her Fry scholarship only covers $22,000 of it. That is more than $18,000 that Emily has to come up with every single year. TCU offers 750 yellow ribbon program scholarships, and they only filled 300 of them this year. These are slots that could go to children like Emily to pursue her dreams and allow her to graduate from college debt-free, a dream her father had for her. TAPS strongly supports Section 108 of HR 3218. TAPS is also advocating for an increase in Chapter 35 education benefits. The current rate is $1,024 per month and is far inferior to the rates of the post-9-11 and Montgomery GI Bills. The rates have not been increased with the exception of for cost of living since 2003. Many of TAPS survivors are not eligible for the Fry Scholarship because a service member died before 9-11 or died in veteran or retiree status. This includes children like Shanna Pellegrin, whose mother, whose mother Navy Lieutenant Corinne Pellegrin, died in the line of duty just a few months before 9-11, making her ineligible for the Fry Scholarship. Shana is a rising sophomore at Virginia Tech. She's also here with us this evening. Her father has had to pay a large portion of Shana's college out of pocket because the $9,000 a year under Chapter 35 is not enough to cover the cost of attendance. While the extra money per month included in proposed legislation would not cover everything, it would make a huge difference to families like Shana's who are not fortunate enough to be eligible for robust benefits like Fry, even though their service and sacrifice were the same. TAPS strongly supports Sections 202 and 203 of HR 3218. We are also grateful for the inclusion of a technical change for transfer to entitlement in Section 109. Currently, a service member or veteran who has transferred their GI Bill can adjust the number of months of eligibility between the different family members. But when they die, those months are locked in, and the family cannot adjust them as needed. This impacts survivors like Colleen Bowman, whose Army husband died from burn pit exposure in 2013. Sergeant Major Bowman was medically retired because of terminal cancer, so his children are not Fry eligible. But Sergeant Major Bowman split his GI Bill between his wife and four daughters. Colleen has no intention of ever using her allocated months and would like to give it to her children. But because of current regulations, she cannot do this. This would not allow families to add new transferees, only adjust the number of months amongst themselves, something the service member would have been able to do if they were still alive. TAPS strongly supports Section 109 of HR 3218. TAPS is proud to have worked closely with partner organizations such as Student Veterans of America, the American Legion, and the Veterans of Foreign War to raise awareness of the many issues in the Harry W. Colmery Veterans Educational Assistance Act of 2017. TAPS supports the bill in its entirety, but specifically the points that impact survivors. We would also like to reiterate our support for the removal of the arbitrary 15-year delimiting date. We understand that these programs are expensive, and we appreciate that there is a recommendation to fund these changes, as well as the upgrades to the GI Bill. Our families have already paid the price for these benefits through the loss of their loved ones. The proposed legislation protects and expands survivor benefits, creates new and innovative programs for veterans, and helps sustain the GI Bill for a new generation of service members. Thank you for this opportunity, and I'm honored to answer any questions. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Haycock, for your advocacy. And it really struck a nerve with me, I know, in, um, let's see, 52 years ago, a good friend of mine was killed in Vietnam and uh, left four children. And basically, our country provided nothing for them. Unbelievable that we provided almost, our lives were worth $10,000 from what Colonel Cook was talking about in Vietnam. This was so easy for me to support, and I was so passionate because of what happened to that family. And to this day, I still mourn him. And it, it affected how his kids grew up, the kind of education they could get. This is a great addition to this bill. And I want to thank you for your advocacy that you do each and every day. 
Mr. Waltz, I have no questions at this time. Um, on behalf of the committee, I want to thank you all for being here, but I have no questions. I'll yield to you. No, I don't either. I would just like to uh, thank you and uh, the words together, I think, again, I, I go back to this of uh, the way we all conduct ourselves in respect of that sacrifice that was given to self-govern and getting this right. And a thank you to uh, Mr. Coy and the VA for, uh, for carrying out these and being partners in this. We really appreciate the, the guidance and the expertise as we started to craft these. So thank you for that. I yield back. Thank you, General Yielding. Mr. Villarocas, you recognize I have no I questions, but I want to thank the ranking member and the chairman and uh, the VSOs for working together for our veterans. This is incredible stuff, and, uh, and it's a big deal. And I may not get in the newspaper tomorrow morning, but this is why we're in Congress. This is what we should be doing uh, to help our true American heroes. So I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I thank you, General Yielding. Mr. Takano, you're recognized for five minutes. I will follow suit and ask no questions, even though I have some, but I will refrain to later. <laughs> we are all we're, up here. We're putting the bar pretty, yeah. pretty, yeah. <laughs> pretty high tonight. <laughs> Mr. Coffin, you're recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I, I have no further questions other to thank the panel uh, for you know, working on this, on this issue and your dedication to it, as well as the chairman and the vice president. I, vice Chairman, I yield back. I thank you, gentlemen, for yielding. Ms. Brownlee, you're recognized for five minutes. I have no further questions either, but too, I want to just express my gratitude to really everybody in this room and the leadership on this committee. Uh, it really is uh, a, an important day uh, and a memorable day and uh, looking forward to the markup and the president's signature and, and getting this bill going. Thank you very much. I yield back. I thank the lady for yielding. Dr. Winstrup, you're recognized for five minutes. I just have one question. Since everyone works so well together on all this, do you all have any questions of us? <laughs> <laughs> if not, I yield back. <laughs> thank you, gentlemen, for yielding. Uh, Ms. Custer, you're recognized for five minutes. I, I don't have any questions. Thank you, and thank you to all our colleagues. And I just hope we can get the word out that Congress can work together and get something done. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, General Lady, for yielding. Ms. Radawagon, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have no further questions. I just want to thank you all for your great service, and God bless America. I yield back. Okay. Uh, Ms. Esty, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. No questions, but just saying this is really a model of democracy, which is not just about Congress working, but about the American people, those of you in this room who served, and those who served by helping us get it right. The military is changing, the country is changing, and it was high time for the GI Bill to change in accordance with it. So congratulations to the chairman and ranking member, everyone on the committee, but most importantly, the people in this room who helped us get it, if not completely right, at least better for those who are serving now. Thanks very much. Thank you, General Lady, for yielding. Uh, Mr. Pollock, when you're recognized for five minutes. God bless the United States of America. God bless our veterans. The more knowledge, the more education, the better. We owe it to our veterans. God bless you. Thank you. No questions, sir. I thank you, General Heal. Mr. Correa, you're recognized for five minutes. No, uh, no questions, but comments again, uh, Mr. Chair and Ranking Member, members of this committee and our veterans. Thank you very much. It looks like a great piece of uh, legislation. Uh, I'm going to put it to the acid test in the next few weeks. I'm going to go back to my district and do a road show with my uh, veterans and, and see what they have to say. I think they're going to be happy, but uh, they have the final say. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Mr. Korea. Thank you, sir. Uh, let's see, Mr. Uh, who is it? Huh? It's me. Oh, okay. Yeah, Dr. Dunn. Sorry. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me add my, my thanks both to you and to Mr. Walls. Uh, it's, uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to serve with you on this committee and also to serve the men and women who served us so well in uniform. I will say that it is sort of sad to contemplate in, in response to your remark about the newspaper. You may not see this in the newspaper tomorrow. We may not, but, uh, but I think it is uh, actually some of the most important things that we've done in a long time up here, and uh, thank you all very much, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for yielding. Uh, General Bergman, you're recognized for five minutes. Well, as the chairman of the Oversight and Investigation Committee, I hope I don't have a follow-up hearing on this. <laughs> uh, and I'm sure the ranking member, Custer, says the, feels the same. 
Uh, thanks to everyone for all you've done, but I do have a quick question. Uh, Mr. Coy, uh, when, you, when you implement the policies in this bill, what do you anticipate the, the biggest challenges are going to be for the, for the VA, knowing this is, this is a change, this is a new bill? What, do you, what are you thinking you're going to run into? I think across the board, when you talk to the people that work at the VA, uh, this bill is an exciting bill for lots of reasons, and many of them have been expressed this evening. Uh, probably my biggest concern uh, is two words, IT. Uh, we have uh, an IT system, uh, and much or almost all of these uh, sections require some degree uh, of changes in our IT system, and that's what concerns me the most, sir. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Hubbard, uh, in, your, in your written testimony, you discussed the IT needs of the GI Bill, and they off, they're often looked. Uh, you, could you please address that thought and how it is, you know, best addressed in this bill? Yes. <clears throat> Thank you for the, the question, Congressman. I appreciate that. Uh, we, too, uh, support the VA on a daily basis. We work closely with their staff uh, and are intimately familiar with uh, many of the needs required to implement many of these provisions. As such, we, we had that uh, expressed in there uh, and certainly fully support the VA. would love to work with this body to ensure that uh, the intent of this legislation is carried out and executed properly uh, and to the full uh, extent of the available uh, provisions provided. Uh, and we look forward to that. Okay. Thank you. And I just, uh, you know, I know it's early in the process here. We're just, you know, we're before even to roll out. But I, I just <coughs> implore the VA and all the VSOs and all those involved with the, the rollout of this, that, that sense of urgency when it comes to actually catching something early on when it's not going right, that sense of urgency brings it to the forefront so we can address the issue on behalf of the veterans. And with that, sir, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen, for yielding. Mr. Banks, you're recognized for five minutes. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Mrs. gonzalez Colon. you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will have no questions, but I, wanna, I would like to uh, commend and recognize your leadership and Mr. Walt. It, it is an honor to serve in this committee under your leadership. I think it's, it's a great opportunity to see things happening in, in just seven months of being here. Uh, so many great legislation. And being here today, uh, amending and having a new bill, a GI bill, uh, I can't vote in the floor, as you may know, as a representative uh, from the island. But this bill, I, I will be in, on Wednesday in this markup, what I do can vote, and uh, representing 3.4 million American citizens that do uh, go to war and represent the United States in every branch of our military that do serve proudly. Uh, I, I feel very honored to be uh, original co-sponsor of this bill. Thank you, and I yield back. I thank the gentlelady for yielding. Mr. Rutherford, you're recognized for five minutes. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. I, ha I have my time. Other, other than I, I, I don't want to miss the opportunity to Thank all of our VSOs, everyone in this room. Thank you so much, uh, panel. And uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and, and uh, ranking member and committee. God bless. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for yielding. And on behalf of this committee, uh, I want to thank each and every one of you for your testimony and your incredible hard work, along with the staff, uh, over the past several months. Uh, you know, we've had a hiccup or two getting where we are tonight sitting here. And Wednesday, we're going to mark this up, and I hopefully get unanimous consent. Uh, and on board, and I just I can't uh, I tell you how much I appreciate personally your your effort of all the organizations in this room that sat down around the table with staff and worked out the issues. And it is the way it should work. And I can't not thank you enough for that. Um, I'll now yield to Mr. Waltz for any closing statements. I think there are th three or four things that that are for me very absolutely terrific. Uh, my my GI Bill benefit ran out in ten years. This is a lifetime benefit. People are having to retrain in their lives now for these incredible tech jobs and so forth that are out there to be had right now, high-paying jobs. Uh, I think the Guard and Reserve, that's bothered me since I've been here, that we didn't call a Guard and Reservist a, a veteran, and it just bothered me, tremendously bothered me. And I think now doing the right thing for the Guard and Reserve was, is, to me, very important. I think the Purple Heart 
uh, recipients. That's, uh, I mean, that goes without, I think Americans wouldn't, wouldn't understand why that wouldn't happen. And I think once they understand that it is happening, I think you'll be, they'll be very pleased that this committee and that, that the VSOs and others have worked toward this means. And another one for me are the Gold Star families that lo lose a, a, a loved one in service to our great nation and then find out that we're not treating them the same as others. That was wrong, and we've corrected those wrongs in this bill. And I, again, once, from, once again, I can't thank you enough for the work you've done to make this uh, successful. And, I, uh, before we close, I ask unanimous consent that statements be submitted into the hearing record for the following organizations and individuals. Representative David McKinley of West Virginia, Representative Mark Wayne Mullen of Oklahoma, Representative Tim Ryan of Ohio, Representative Susan Brooks of Indiana, Representative Raul Labrador of Idaho, the Military Order of the Purple Heart, the National Guard Association of the United States, the Veterans Education Success, Captain Edward H. Hill, uh, Vietnam Veterans of America, High Ground Veterans Advocacy, Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America, hearing no objection, so ordered. I'll, I now ask unanimous consent that all members have five legislative days to revise and extend their remarks and include extraneous material here, no objection, so ordered. I would like to remind the members we'll hold a full committee hearing markup on this legislation as well as other bills pending before the committee 10 a.m. on Wednesday of this week. I thank all members in attendance tonight. Meeting is adjourned.